Hello, I would like to welcome and greet you all to today's virtual seminar on the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Um, yesterday marked the 35 years since the devastating accident at reactor number four of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. So today we're very fortunate to welcome historian, professor and author Kate Brown to talk about the accident. My name is Jessica and I'm an upcoming graduate of the Masters of Public Policy and Global Affairs at UBC's School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. And I'll be providing a few welcoming remarks and introducing um, our two moderators for today. I want to begin this event with a traditional territorial acknowledgement. Located in downtown Vancouver, I want to acknowledge that the land on which I learn, work, live, and play is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Stolo, and tsleil nations. For those of us located on the UBC Point Grey campus, I acknowledge on their behalf that they are joining from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. So we sincerely thank First Nation uh, First Nations communities that have protected and have been stewards of the land since the beginning of time. And we honor and recognize the communities who continue to this day to defend the land, air and waterways that we all get to enjoy. Now I recognize that there are people joining here, um, joining the seminar today from across Canada and perhaps even around the world. So I really encourage you all to take a moment to reflect on the history of the land that you call home. Now, I also wanna share a few administrative details for today's seminar. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will later be uploaded to the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs event page, as well as our YouTube channel later on today or after this event. And then throughout the event, you are all welcome and encouraged to pose your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom um, of your Zoom window. Please do not use the chat, but really uh, pose your questions in the Q&A function. And lastly, just before I introduce our moderators, the organizers, and I want to thank the partners of today's event. Um, and so there are three, the first being the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. Secondly, the UBC History Department. And lastly, the UBC Graduate Program in Science and Technology Studies. We are very fortunate to have both Director McFarlane and Professor Romana join us today. Both of our moderators hold extensive research and professional experience on a wide array of topics related to nuclear energy and have published both academic papers and books on the topic as well. Dr. Allison McFarlane is currently a professor and the director of the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs here at UBC. She has held both academic and government positions in the field of energy and environmental policy with a strong focus on nuclear policy. And her research has focused on technical, social, and policy aspects of nuclear energy production, as well as nuclear waste management, amongst many other topics. Ramana is professor and Simon's chair in discernment, global, and human security at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. He is the director of the Liu Institute for Global Issues and a scholar at the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies for this year. He studies nuclear power programs in many countries and is part of a team that produces the annual World Nuclear Industry Status Report. So with that, I will now pass it off to Director McFarland, who will introduce our guest speaker for today. Thanks so much, Jessica. <clears throat> and welcome everyone to this important uh, discussion on the Chernobyl accident, which happened 35 years ago in uh, what was then the Soviet Union and may have had implications in the final end of the Soviet Union. Um, <clears throat> in that time period since then, in those 35 years, we have experienced another major nuclear accident the Fukushima accident, which happened 10 years ago in 2011. Uh, but the Chernobyl accident remains the, the largest accident in terms of uh, radiation release and impacts of that radiation release on human beings um, <clears throat> since. And, uh, and there have been lots of 
issues surrounding Chernobyl. It's still an area that uh, is a no-go area. People can't, aren't supposed to live there. Um, and its impacts last to today. So we will be hearing lots about this and we are really, really lucky to have with us discussing this, um, Professor Kate Brown. Kate Brown is a professor of science, technology and society at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Mass. She's the author of several prize winning histories, including Plutopia, Nuclear Families, Atomic Cities, and the Great Soviet and American Plutonium Disasters. That's from published by Oxford Press in 2013. Her latest book, Manual for Survival, A Chernobyl Guide to the Future, published by Norton in 2019, was, has been translated into nine languages and won the Marshall Shulman and Regional, sorry, Reginald Zelnick Prizes for the best book in European, East European history plus the silver medal for the Laura Shannon Book Prize. Uh, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Professor Brown. Thanks, Allison and Jessica for those uh, introductions. Um, I wanna share my screen. Um, and I wanna talk um, about the Chernobyl accident how we frame the accident, um, the controversy over the accident's uh, impact in terms of the environment and, and, in, and human health, um, and how we might think less of this event as a discrete accident and more as a point of acceleration on a timeline of exposures. So hey, basically, can yeah. Can I interrupt for just a sec? Can you mm -hmm. click on use slideshow you don't see the slideshow we we just we see like we see what you see but you want us to see oh. show so if you click click on use slideshow i think that will solve this problem yeah i see yeah got it um, um maybe not there we go actually think sorry Wait, Kate, it's how does that work? um yeah oh, there, we there go. you go got it okay super um so first, let me tell you a little bit about the accident. Uh, it occurred April 26, 1986. Uh, no, chap, react, reactor number four of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant blew up and then it exploded again. The accident released between 50 and 200 million curies of radioactivity into the environment. That's an awful lot of destructive energy. Within 36 hours, Soviet officials drew a circle around the area and declared it the zone of alienation. And over the course of the next few weeks, they resettled 120,000 people from this zone. Um, we hear a lot about the accident, dramatic stories. Um, so I was surprised when I first started working in this project in 2014, that we know very little for certain about the outcome of the accident. Um, how many people died, how many people got sick, for instance. Um, so I tried to figure out what I could. And the first thing I did is I did what historians do, I, I went to the archives and I walked into the archives in Kiev and I asked the archivist for the Ministry of Health files on the Chernobyl accident and, and they laughed at me. They said, that was a banned topic during Soviet power. You won't find anything on that. Um, I asked, I said, well, you know, I've come all this way. Why don't we just take a look anyway? And within a couple of minutes, it didn't take a great sleuth. We found whole large bound volumes saying in plain Ukrainian, the medical consequences of the Chernobyl catastrophe. And as I set to that first day reading, I realized I would be at this project for years. There was just a Klondike of records. Um, and the records are full of surprises. For instance, um, Moscow leaders said that the disaster was safely contained within the Chernobyl zone here. Um, but I found records that point to a deliberate contamination outside of the zone. Uh, for instance, three days after the accident, a big storm cloud was brewing um, and it was gonna blow northeast of the Chernobyl X of, of the disaster site towards the big Russian cities of Moscow, Yaroslavl, and Baronish. 
So pilots went up, they seeded the clouds, and they let it rain on rural Belarus in order to save urban Russia. And, and you can see here from this map, here is the Chernobyl site right down here. This is southern Belarus, angry uh, red spots right next to the accident. Um, here is Gomel, city of about half a million people. The pilots uh, held off, and then they let it rain right here in what is basically a second Chernobyl zone, but one which few disaster tourists visit, uh, which journalists don't go to when they're getting their story about nature thriving in the zone. Now, this was a triage operation, and maybe it was OK to spare millions of people in cities um, and, expose, but, and expose about 200,000 people who were farmers living in this red area down below. The only problem is they didn't tell anyone in Belarus about it, not even the leader of the Belarusian Communist Party. So people lived um, in this, these areas of, of terrifically high levels of radiation until about 1999, when the second Chernobyl zone was finally depopulated. Another narrative is Soviet officials told people they tested the food and they found it was safe. Um, I worked through the Ministry of Agriculture records and I found vectors of contaminated food spreading, especially where humans congregated. Animals grazing under radioactive clouds started to feel to look um, and show signs of, of damage soon after the event. So um, uh, cowboys went in and they slaughtered 100,000 head of livestock. Now, in the Soviet Union at the time, meat was an especially uh, scarce and valuable product and, and they they just hated to throw away this meat. So I found in the archives uh, an instruction manual for meat packers in this post-nuclear accident. And, and that's why I call this a manual for survival is I find all kinds of manuals coming out of the archive to instruct people how to live in a, in a landscape that's been contaminated with high levels of radioactivity. Um, so the meat packers manual said that take the meat uh, and grade it high, medium and low levels of radioactivity. Take the medium and the low levels, mix it together with clean meat and make sausage. Send that sausage all over the Soviet Union, label it as you normally would, just don't send any, any of that sausage to Moscow, better spare Leningrad as well. The high levels of meat, they were supposed to store in freezers and wait for the meat to decay, the radioactivity in the meat to decay. Pretty quickly, uh, meat packers in Gomel and in northern Ukraine are asking for more freezers. And they keep asking, meaning they don't get enough. Uh, eventually, the Gomel meat packing plant finds a refrigerated train car and they stuff it with uh, 6,000 tons of radioactive meat. And they send the train to Baku. In Baku, the Geiger counters go off, they send it to Armenia, so on and so forth. This radioactive ghost train circulated around the Soviet Union for a full four years until the KGB finally buried the train and its radioactive contaminants in the Chernobyl zone, probably where it should have gone in the first place. Um, in that secret second Chernobyl zone in Mogilev uh, province, three quarters of milk was over permissible levels. Um, in 1987, 22% of all mother's milk had higher than permissible levels. In 1988, a quarter of all milk was still too hot to drink. So this is a persistent problem. I can also see from the typical radiation map that, um, that it didn't necessarily make sense. For instance, here's this town of Chernihiv. It's about 50 uh, miles from the accident site. It, the winds didn't blow its way. It didn't get much fallout. It was a relatively clean town. But I find a document that um, mentions that uh, 200 wool workers in Chernigov got status as liquidators. Now, liquidators are people who um, had documented exposures and were um, given compensation for their part in the cleanup of the accident. So I wondered about that. How could that happen? In my mind, liquidators were firemen risking their lives to extinguish the burning reactor. They weren't women textile workers in a clean town 50 miles away. So I dug around in the files of the Ministry of Agriculture, and then I finally drove to Chernigov for a visit. Um, I learned that the women were um, working with bales of wool measuring 3.2 micro gen an hour. Um, now that's a lot of, of, of radioactivity. That's like hugging an x-ray machine while it's turned on and doing that several times a day. 
I interviewed the factory managers. They told me they had a small problem in 1986. They fixed it. Everything was fine. I talked to the workers. Of my 200 on the list, 10 were still there on their jobs. Um, and I asked, I said, where's everybody else? As they picked their names out of my list. And they said, oh, the rest have either died or they've been invalided out on pensions. Now, these women had no more than a high school degree, yet I was impressed by their knowledge of radiobiology. They pointed to parts of their bodies that were ached or diseased, and they related which radioactive isotopes were lodged there. They knew where the uh, uh, factory's radioactive wastewater went um, into the municipal drinking water. I didn't quite believe them, but I, then I, I, based on that, thanks to their tip, I went and checked it out, and, and indeed they were right. I could tell from these archival records that these workers remembered better, knew more than the managers who, who directed them. Another story, um, officially, um, Soviet leaders said they gave medical exams to 900,000 people and they saw no change in health statistics. Uh, Moscow officials said that uh, 300 people were hospitalized from the accident. Um, uh, these were mostly firemen and nuclear plant operators. But that was a count from only one hospital, the Radiation Medicine Hospital in Moscow. When you, we started, I have two research assistants helping with this project and we looked at um, all the hospitals that took Chernobyl uh, survivors. And we found that not 300 people were hospitalized, but 40,000 people were hospitalized from Chernobyl exposures in the summer after the accident. 11,000 of them were children. Records show that immediately after the accident, doctors treated sick children and adults. They, rec they recorded an increase in thyroid problems, complications at birth, birth defects, uh, infant mortality, and, and children and pregnant women were especially hard hit. In 1987, in contaminated regions, half of the children had enlarged thyroids. Perinatal deaths doubled in 1987 and tripled in 1988. In one county of 103 pregnancies, 63 babies were born alive. Among adults, cases of heart disease, enlarged thyroids, gastrointestinal and urinary tract disorders, cataracts, liver and blood disease tripled or doubled between 1984 and 1988. Cancer rates climbed as well, five times higher per capita in that second Chernobyl zone in the Mogilev province um, than, before, than in anywhere else in Belarus. Um, and here's a couple of visualizations. Um, th these two um, individuals are just post-op from thyroid cancer. And you can see here, um, this boy has some problems with growth uh, hormones as well. Here's one document. This is the kind of documents we're finding in the archives. This one says that of um, 1,553 kids in this county, 1,132 had one chronic health problem or another. And, and this is a 1989 document. And, and we find that there's a real flip. Um, socialist me medicine sort of just had this uh, normalized epidemiology and they had this category of healthy. Um, before 1986, about 80 to 90% of the kids in the county would be deemed healthy, 10 to 20 would have some chronic health problem. That switches by 1988 and we find 80 to 90% with some kind of chronic health problem and only 10 to 20% healthy. Here's another uh, document that shows the rates of uh, children ages four to six who are sick with um, anemia. And you can see this is in Southern Belarus and you can see this, um, it's just like an, an arrow going uh, to infinity upward over these, the course of the years. Uh, you know, just trying to figure out how many people died was a real problem for this um, project. Uh, UN websites give the number of, of between 33 and 54 people um, dead from the accident uh, with a projection of four to 6,000 people to die in the future from Chernobyl related cancers. Greenpeace projected 90,000 dead. Um, the lower numbers were most often cited in publications like the New York Times or Washington Post. Uh, but I found, you know, in, in Ukraine alone, 35,000 women received compensation for, because their husbands died of a Chernobyl related illness. Um, now that just includes men who died, who had documented exposures, that number doesn't, and who were married, it doesn't include anybody else, women, unmarried men, and children. Uh, off the record in 2016, at the 30 year anniversary, uh, Ukrainian officials estimated about 150,000 people died. 
we couldn't find any count at all for Belarus or Russia. They, they make no, um, they give no numbers about the number of people, uh, medical problems or fatalities from each other accident. So 35,000 seems to be a minimal number if, if one believes the Ukrainian records. So I, I, I worked to sort out these confusing records in the archives. Who was right? Was there really a public health disaster involving up to 4 million people that we know almost nothing about? How could a, a problem of this magnitude slip beneath the radar? The textual records had many contradictions and conflicting measurements, plus some strange occurrences. In the Soviet Union in 1990, four different hard drives with unique data on doses residents received were stolen from four different Soviet medical institutions and, and the, that data has never been recovered. I found in the archives that Soviet officials falsified accounts while KGB agents planted fake news in, in um, newspaper uh, venues. I also noticed that consultants for UN agencies disappeared evidence and dismissed about half of the research sent to them from local researchers in the field on health effects. Thinking of the 2016 elections, and this is the context in which I was working, I grasped that archives and reports could have been planted in the archives for me to find later. You can see the level of suspicion I was getting to. So I realized, you know, people lie, therefore archives lie. How do I fact check this story? So I sought to locate uh, sources that might help me uh, fact check, maybe sources that were more reliable. What about the landscape, I thought? Maybe trees, don't lie. So I called a forester to ask for a tour of the local ecology. Um, and one thing to know about the Chernobyl um, landscape is it occurred in the midst of what is Europe's largest uh, swamp, the Pripyat Marshes. And um, this region is, is an absolutely gorgeous ecosystem. It's a large sandy bowl transected by 17 rivers and hundreds of lakes and streams and ponds. In the 1960s, Soviet hydrologists dried up large portions of the swamp for agriculture and to make room for the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, um, which as you you probably know nuclear power plants require a lot of a lot of water, and this was going to be Europe's largest plant with a projected projected ten reactors. So I looked around for a part of the swamp that wasn't um, dried out and, and mitigated by Soviet hydrologists, and there was this area called the Olmani Swamp in southern Belarus, and I asked a forester to take me um, on a tour of this area. And the Almani Swamp was spared amelioration because it was turned in 1961 into an Air Force bombing range. Um, so as we went around, we looked at spent ordnance and uh, um, you know, the uh, places where the generals would watch um, the flight paths of the pilots. And we went to a couple of sites that had been villages, but the um, army had moved people out before it became a bombing range. And so we were standing around this old cemetery uh, looking at the only thing that was left, which is which are some grave sites. Um, and I notice uh, this bomb crater and some pine trees growing out of the bomb crater. Um, and I looked, I took a closer look and, and the, I saw this, these mutations on this you know, pine tree. You know, needles of uh, pine needles are all supposed to grow in one direction. And when they do this, when they curl, when they, when they head off in different directions, uh, biologists call them uh, disorderly. Um, and there's a, a few things that can cause mutations in pine trees, but uh, radiation is, is a pretty good candidate. And I, I asked the, the forester, you know, how old do you think this pine tree is? And, and he said, oh, about 50 years, he estimated. So I said that that was, you know, 10, 20 years before Chernobyl. And uh, the forester shook his head and he said, um, he looked a little disturbed and he said, yeah. And so we looked around and, and there were other pine trees around, but none of them were growing out of the crater and none of them had mutations. So looking at this crooked pine tree, I was reminded of the persistence of radioactive contaminants in this part of the world. And I placed it in a file I had with unverified accounts of the Soviets testing small strategic nuclear weapons in this bombing range in the 1960s. I couldn't find archival confirmation of that testing because the records of Soviet nuclear testing was off limits to researchers. 
And that's the nature of state power. It can make the past that is, as it is constituted in archives go away if it so deems. But I had other evidence that pointed to peculiar exposures in the marshes before Chernobyl. In the 1960s, uh, a team of Soviet researchers, um, people who specialized in nuclear accidents showed up in the Almani swamp and they carried out uh, uh, a study for four years. And they looked at radiation in uh, soils, in the water, in plants, and in the bodies of people who lived on the perimeter of the marshes. And they found um, 10 to 30 times more cesium in the bodies of villagers than people in Minsk and Kiev. And they produced this map and the, the dark areas where is pretty much where we were was with the higher levels of radiation. And then you see these splotchy red areas. Um, and right over, and this is pretty far um, to the west of Chernobyl. Chernobyl would be down in the lower right-hand corner. Um, so more generally, staring at that crooked pine, I realized that the perforations of radioactive isotopes into organisms of the swamp long predated the day of the Chernobyl explosions in April, 1986. And with that, I came to understand Chernobyl rather than a one-off accident, it might better be conceived of as an acceleration. Um, and the reason that is important is that if Chernobyl is an accident, then it is a discrete event with a clear beginning, middle and end. But seeing Chernobyl as a point of acceleration on a timeline of destruction, I began to visualize a much larger succession of events that are ongoing and in flux, a set of occurrences that shape the present and the future as I try to write about them. And that made Chernobyl a kind of slippery topic to research. Um, just measuring time and scale to calibrate cause and effect the usual goals of our histories was kind of difficult with the Chernobyl topic. Um, take time, for instance. Physicists have been saying for 100 years that time is a human construct that um, as it's measured in, in seconds and, and, um, and decades and um, eventually millennia, but rather that time expands and contracts in unpredictable ways. And, and Chernobyl brings that insight into sharp focus. People and animals exposed to Chernobyl fallout experienced a rapid radiation aging. For them, time sped up after the accident. Uh, in the Red Forest, which took the hardest hit of, um, of Chernobyl contaminants, um, they call it the Red Forest because the pine trees after the accident turned red and then they died and foresters came in and chopped down these trees. Now this photograph was taken 25 years after the accident. Um, you can see that if Rumpelstiltskin had fallen asleep and woken up 25 years later, he would not be able to tell how much time had passed because the normal agents of decomposition, uh, microbes, insects, are not doing the work in the red forest as they would. Um, normally these trees would have been gone in about 10 years. Um, and then there's problem of scale. You spill a thousand curies and the IEA calls it a level five emergency. Spill 900,000 times more curies and Chernobyl is registered as a level seven emergency. Um, Chernobyl records show that people quickly lost track of this explosive amount of destructive energy spreading from the plant. We see that today as scientists try to deal with the planetary scope of climate change, that the scaling up of catastrophe can be paralyzing. So these problems of time and scale led me to continue to search for ways other than text and numbers to understand Chernobyl as a political and environmental and social event. So I called up the only two biologists I could find that regularly do work in the Chernobyl zone. And, and this is Tim Mousseau on the, on the left and Anders Moller on the right. And they invited me to come along on their twice annual trips into the zone. And I learned a lot from them. Uh, most often we hear in the media about the thriving Chernobyl zone. Um, and, and that claim is perhaps too simple. Uh, this portrait is created by, by, by journalists who uh, make quick flyby trips to the zone. And, and I think editors are, are really seduced by the story that nature writes itself after human catastrophes. But the biologist taught me that there was no singular zone of radioactivity, but a patchy mosaic where radiation differs by four orders of magnitude. 
Uh, they taught me about the interconnections of the ecosystem. They documented, for instance, a decline in pollinators, which led to a loss of frugivores or fruit eating birds with less fruit and fewer birds, seeds did not spread. They counted all of uh, three new fruit trees that had seeded after 1986 in the hotter areas. It's a whole cascade of extinction, in other words, that they recorded. Every rock we turn over, Musso says, we find signs of damage. Uh, in 2007, while I was following them, we went to the Red Forest, uh, something that I had been hoping to avoid. Um, and it's not a pretty forest. You see um, really sort of major, major mutations of um, this pine trees that were planted commercially to grow board straight. Uh, you see a lack of ground cover and these pine trees are trying to become um, pine trees, but they only manage to be shrubs because of mutations. And I had expected about 50 micro sieverts an hour. But as we walked along, my Geiger counter started screeching. Um, it was almost um, uh, a milli. It was 994 micro sieverts an hour. And um, I wasn't happy. And I asked Tim, so, you know, what's going on? And, and he said, oh, last fall we had a fire here um, and that volatized radiation stored in the leaf litter. And it became uh, the burning wood and ash that I was standing on became radioactive smoke um, and released um, a great deal of radioactivity. Um, and this probably would have been a, a major radiation event, but it was not covered in the media and the IEA did not scale it. And and I think the problem with long radioactive half-lives is the same as chemical toxins, that the time scales stretch beyond the capacity of so social memory uh, and human attention. So if that crooked pine tree shows how radiation predated Chernobyl, the red forest and the fires in 2017 describe how um, radiation continued long after the accident. And it's this ongoing quality that plagued Soviet leaders. As much as they tried, they could not close the chapter on Chernobyl. In 1990, admitting that the biological load was too much, leaders in Ukraine and Belarus announced plans to resettle 200,000 more people. But before these new rounds of evacuations could occur, the Soviet Union collapsed and money ran out for resettlement. As that happened, UN agencies took over managing the disaster, especially assessments of the disaster. Um, and they asserted, uh, two teams came in, the World Health Team um, in 1989, and a team led by the International Atomic Energy Agency in, in 1990. And they asserted that resettlement wasn't necessary, uh, that doses were too low compared to the Hiroshima at uh, Nagasaki studies of bomb survivors. And so pressured by UN officials, delegates voted down Chernobyl aid in the form of $1 billion for resettlement and to do a long-term wide-scale study of Chernobyl health effects. As the post-Soviet economic crisis deepened, subsidies for clean food and medical monitoring withered. The neoliberal orientation of Ukraine and Belarus in the 1990s made it easier ideologically to abandon people to their own fate on contaminated ground. I think we see this globally as more and more people live in environments saturated with toxins, risk has become privatized. The constriction of the social welfare state and the planet in a state of ecological stress is a correlation. Whether there is a connection between those two factors is a question I think scholars and humanities should not leave to scientists alone. So as commentators in the West announced the end of history in the 1990s, the people on Chernobyl, Chernobyl contaminated ground were left to carry on, on alone. They ate what they grew um, with few other options. The few doctors uh, left and about 50 hospitals were about half staff, about 60% of doctors left the area. Um, there were few doctors around to monitor the health effects if there were any to see. In one of the few studies carried out by Vladimir Vitalecki, he found um, six times higher rates of birth defects of neurotube disorders in um, the Rivni province, six times higher than the European norm, um, and higher rates of cesium in the bodies of the parents of these uh, children. 
Now this jump in birth defects could be from Chernobyl contaminants or from uh, Chernobyl contaminants and pre-Chernobyl uh, radioactive radioactivity. It could be from um, nitrates and pesticides spread on um, farms um, and in addition to the exposure synergistically to radioactivity. I think my tour through the pre-pit marshes shows that the areas that these scientists study, these living laboratories are charred remnants pitted with deposits of spent ammunition, heavy metals, chemical toxins, and radioactivity that were distributed at a frenetic pace in the course of the 20th century. Now you might respond to this information by feeling empathy for people out there, um, those people in the Rivni province of the Ukrainian state, a uh, discrete part of the world. Uh, and that's how I was trained to think of history when I was in graduate school, that it was something that played out within national boundaries. But now that we have an awareness of the planetary scale of human actions, we have a cognizance that diminishes the importance of national boundaries. Those events out there make it home. Traveling in Northern Ukraine uh, during the summers I worked on this project, I, I noticed that thousands of people were harvesting wild organic blueberries from the pre-pit marshes. Um, and then they were met by, by buyers on the road who would buy these berries as soon as the pickers came out of the forest. And, and each, the buyers told me they each buy about two tons uh, of, a day. And so my research assistant and I, Olya Martinuk, we went undergrad, underground blueberry picking. And um, here I am just selling my, my berries to the buyers. And then we followed the buyers to the, to the warehouse where this nice lady was um, purchasing the berries. And, um, but before she purchased them, she first measured them for radioactivity. And, and I asked her, how many of these berries are radioactive? And she said, all the berries are radioactive, just some are really radioactive, like 3000 becquerels a kilogram. Now the Ukrainian norm at the time was 450 becquerels a kilogram. Um, and so 3000 becquerels was, was quite high, but I noticed as she, we stood around as she bought the berries from the buyers that she bought the ones that were both above the permissible norm and below the permissible norm. And she put them on both sides of the room. Um, and I asked, well, why are you buying these berries that are that are over 450 becquerels a kilogram? And and the buyer, the the she didn't tell me anything, but the pickers explained to it. They said it's like the sausage. You mix mix the cleaner ones with the dirtier ones, and you get to the European norm, which is 1,250 becquerels a kilogram. And then they can go over the border into the EU. Um, and since uh, Ukraine joined the European Association in 2014. Ukraine annually sells at least 20,000 tons of Chernobyl berries um, into the European Union. And the, from there, they circulate the globe. In fact, I found a Homeland Security report of a, of a truck crossing the border from Canada into the United States. And inside was a, a radiating mass. When the border agents looked inside, they found um, berries from Ukraine. And so I called up that um, agent and I said, well, what did you do? He goes, well, it was within the permissible norm, so we let them in to the United States. Now, now those berries are getting a little closer to our own breakfast plates. Um, but if you ask a specialist in radiation about those berries, they would tell you not to worry that since the onset of nuclear bomb tests in the 50s, all humans have man-made radioactive isotopes in their bodies. And I think this point underlines uh, what I have found that the Chernobyl accident serves only as an exclamation point in a chain of toxic, toxic exposures that have remastered landscapes, societies, politics, and bodies, including our bodies. Describing Chernobyl as an accident is a broom that sweeps away the larger story, which is more important. So one reason there has been so little research on Chernobyl medical health effects, other than this one, um, one outcome, which is pediatric thyroid cancer. And, and there's been a great deal of research about that once uh, UN agencies admitted there was a problem uh, in 1996, is that um, scientists and funding agencies have thrown up their hands uh, at the complexity of these uh, uh, layers of contaminants in environments. Another research, uh, for another reason for the paucity of, of research I found while working through five UN 
um, agency archives, is that UN agents work to minimize the story of a public health disaster. I found them hiding biopsies of, of children with pediatric thyroid cancer, burying data, slandering and discrediting opposing scientists, uh, trying to fire scientists who um, told an alternative story. And once I published my book, Manual for Survival, industry sciences started to slander me as well. Now you might ask, why would UN agencies do that? But I found that um, UN officials serve their client states and their client states are also the big nuclear powers, US, France, Great Britain, and Russia. And these countries in the 1990s were on the line for billions of dollars uh, in liability as the record of Cold War production and testing of nuclear weapons came clear from the um, declassified archives. But if um, you could instrumentalize Chernobyl, things might be all right. And so if you could say, look, Chernobyl was the worst nuclear accident in human history and only 54 people died, then those lawsuits could go away. And that's indeed what happened in the uh, 1990s and 2010s. Almost all of those lawsuits failed. Um, and that's where the accident narrative was useful. See Chernobyl as a one-off disaster and the liabilities, the cost of cleanup, the ongoing public health disaster dissolves. But it's a different story if Chernobyl you see as an acceleration in a half century in which the Soviet Union and the United States alone released not 45 million curies of, of radioactive iodine and iodine is a pernicious uh, short-lived isotope that goes to the human thyroid and causes thyroid disease and thyroid cancer. But um, 100 billion curies of, of radioactivity was released by um, the Americans at just the Nevada test site. Um, so, and that spread in, in a line across uh, North America, um, going up into parts of Canada as well, though you don't find that on the, uh, on the maps because we cut it off at the United States. So here's, um, here's these brown areas are the hottest areas and you see uh, hot spots of radiation up into the Dakotas, here where the rain comes down in the Minnesotas um, where you know, sheep were, were dying from the ill effects of, of, of nuclear testing in the 1950s, uh, you see this problem. And here again, I, I, I think uh, scale confounds the issue. Global fallout spread after 90, 1951, mostly in the Northern hemisphere. In the same decades, the rates of cancers, especially childhood cancers, once a medical rarity increased as well in the Northern hemisphere. So too did birth, defect, birth defects and fertility problems. Uh, thyroid and pediatric cancers continue to grow. In fact, cancers among people born after 1952 are on the rise. Male sperm counts in the Northern Hemisphere are half of what they were in 1945. Now these diminished human health indicators um, also became the, the new background against which Chernobyl statistics were measured. We have what scientists call a shifting background syndrome. In other words, the scale of possible damage from global testing that released uh, 150 billion curies of radioactive iodine is too oversized for us to even see. It's a huge fact saturating our daily existence. So I just wanna leave you, and, and here's some of the cancer statistics. Um, I wanna leave you with this last image. Um, this is a, a girl, a 12 year old who is a picker in the forest. And you can see from her blue lips that she picks some berries and she eats some berries. Um, but I also hope you can see how she is also a nuclear waste worker there to make a living off the toxic detritus left behind on land abandoned by others. But maybe there's also another way to think of this. Um, those berries and mushrooms are doing what an army of Soviet and internationals have not managed to accomplish. They are cleaning radioactive isotopes from soils and plants. Rather than seeing these berries as produce, we could see these berries as allies in the cleanup. Pay the swamp dwellers $25 a day, because uh, that's an income they really rely on, and then deposit the berries in a radioactive waste depot. Uh, invite disaster tourists to come into the Pripyat marshes and pick radioactive blueberries, and they would pay to pick berries, and then that month, those berries would be deposited in radioactive waste chamber. Once we start to focus on this problem, we can start to envision solutions on multiple levels. Um, and I think 
um, that that's what it takes is looking at these environmental problems without denials, with our, our eyes wide open, then I think we can picture a brave new world. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Kate. That was a wonderful talk. Um, and you provide a very rich discussion of not just the accident, but about the fact that it has meant, uh, what it has meant for sort of even time itself, about time speeding up and the multiple acts, impacts as well as the cascading and overlapping effects. So it was really great. Um, I want to pick up on a couple of things that you said in the talk. So um, one thing which I uh, was thinking about was you mentioned in a couple of times about how the media covers the impacts of Chernobyl, uh, in particular, you know, the kind of tourism aspect of it and, you know, journalists sort of moving in and out. But if you want to sort of zoom out and ask in a more general context, how do you think the media typically covers what's happening in Chernobyl? We saw a recent uh, story in CNN and National Geographic about a study that seems to show little genetic uh, transmission and so on. But thinking more broadly, how do you think about this? Well, I think the, it's a very seductive narrative to think that humans can, um, you know, contaminate uh, an area and that all it takes is for humans to walk away and then nature restores itself. Um, so the line about nature's thriving in the Chernobyl zone is that um, humans are worse for animals than radiation. Um, and so I, you know, I follow these two biologists around the, as I, as I showed, they, they, they see a whole cascade of, of problems um, and then I went to the, the radio ecologist conferences and I noticed that there, there was just, you know, really like one scientist left who was saying that um, nature is thriving in the zone and the, all the other scientists had really uh, come to realize that there are real problems. Um, but this story about nature thriving really persists. Um, same with the problem of, of the story about not having, um, it, you know, I think the National Geographic um, stories, they looked at just uh, 120 people uh, stem cells um, and saw no no problem. And so the story was no genetic damage at all, um, which doesn't take into account non-stem cell DNA. And, and we know now that uh, uh, the bodies of organisms are far more uh, adaptable and far more, uh, have far more um, uh, uh, sort of genetic mutations at the uh, level below you know, stem cells that they can then pass on to their offspring. And um, so this epigenetic studies is not included in this big statement. And so uh, to me, that seems like a, a big gap, but, but we, I guess you know, part of the problem of, of the Anthropocene and, and of climate change is that um, it would be great if, if we could just um, step back and, and have things right themselves. And I think that's part of the seduction of that story. And, you know, so Chernobyl Stands is like a small version of a bigger Anthropocene story writ large. Yeah, but I mean, I, I wonder also whether this is part of a, a different narrative, which is uh, what you mentioned, which is that for the, to deal with climate change, there are some people who think nuclear power is necessary and that, you know, it's a kind of a technological solutionism kind of approach where you say, you know, technology is already spoiled things for us, but we're just going to throw more technology at it and hope that it's going to work out. Uh, but for that story to work out, you have to somehow mitigate the consequences of Chernobyl uh, and make it seem that if even the worst accident is not such a big deal, then, you know, we, we can live with this technology. Yeah, I mean, it is really remarkable, um, you know, as opposed, I think, to, to Fukushima and Three Mile Island, when you look at Chernobyl, the, the impact of Chernobyl um, is not that profound, uh, in, in part because of this pretty big effort to minimize um, any recording of its effects. So after Three Mile Island, Americans got really concerned. And what you see is, is basically a self-imposed moratorium on new nuclear power plants being built in the United States. It, it really had a big effect. Uh, you don't really see that after Chernobyl um, in the same way. In fact, as I said, with these lawsuits, um, what you see is the opposite effect is instrumentalizing Chernobyl to say, look, no problem, biggest nuclear power. And we only have 33 people that we can live with those that kind of risk. Um. I want to pick on a different thing that you said. You mentioned uh, this, uh, this uh, interview with these workers at the 
factory and how they knew better than the manager. And I want to sort of, again, use that to reflect on the idea of sort of experts and expertise. Right? And you're doubtlessly familiar with Brian Wynn's work uh, in Cumbria where the you know, sh sheep farmers were misled by uh, the uh, radiation specialists in the UK to say, oh, you know, everything is going to be all right when actually the cesium behaved very differently from there. And so more thinking in more broadly, what does the, all your studies sort of tell you about how we should be thinking about expertise and experts in the context of radiation and health uh, and in nuclear power in general? Yeah, you know, the really fascinating thing is there were thousands of letters in the archives from concerned citizens writing their, their state um, saying, you know, we, we think there are real problems where we live. And keep in mind that people lived in contaminated areas uh, until 1989 for a full three years without knowing that they were living in contaminated areas. You know, the, the, the map of radiation exposure was not published until uh, June of 1989. So for three years, people guessed. They they realized they were getting special subsidies for you know clean food. Um, they saw radiation monitors walking around, but they didn't officially know what levels they were looking at. But they write their leaders and they say, you know, um, and they give numbers, which means they made alliances with radiation monitors who were not supposed to tell them numbers, but did. And and they also give numbers of of cancers and health problems. So they made alliances with doctors, um, and they say. Look, you know, um, our town didn't get any fallout. You know, we're, we're, we're a relatively clean town, but we have these trucks passing through from the Chernobyl zone and they go right through our town and, the, and their dust leaves all along the roadside, these radioactive traces. And, and so then they come up with a really good solution. They say, you know, if you just built a bypass road around our town, we would be fine. Or our town is pretty good, but we, right in the schoolyard, we have these really, these hot spots of radioactivity. Could you just asphalt? You know, so, so what I find is that as opposed to scientists who sort of parachute into these communities, look around, get some numbers and then leave, people living there, especially, you know, these are farmers, um, these are people embedded in communities, so they know who's sick, they know what's happening, they have their own um, sort of uh, local geography of both their community and of their landscapes, they know where the hotspots are, they know where the problems are. and. Um, over and over again, whether they were Soviet experts who would come in or they're experts from the UN, what you hear is these people are hysterical. Um, and often the, the public is, is sort of gendered as, as an hysterical female. Um, they're, they don't take care of themselves. That's why they're sick. Um, you know, so their medical problems are their own fault. They're, and they are rational. And they would sort of push back on, on this, you know, really sort of sound um, local information gathering that people in these localities had. And so I think Chernobyl speaks to perhaps a, a more in, um, uh, engaged and, and um, med, you know, uh, means of gathering scientific um, uh, uh, solutions, especially for environmental problems. You know, like the, the US EPA has a category called stakeholders, um, but over and over again, stakeholders feel that they're not heard, that they're sort of pushed back and refuted. But I, I think if scientists, um, they continually talk about how, well, we need to have a better, we need to find out ways to better inform the public, to get the public to understand our message, where I think that scientists should also think about learning to be better listeners and, and learn from the public. Uh, just following on that one question, um, would you, uh, did, what kind of feedback did you get? What kind of pushback did you get? And especially were you ever criticized for being a historian sort of coming into this complicated area? You know, what do you know about radiation biology, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, lots of that. Um, lots of, uh, you know, uh, uh, James Smith, who's the, who's the Nature is Thriving um, uh, um, radiation ecologist, um, he was upset that he thought that I, um, I didn't take into consideration the work of the Chernobyl Forum and the work of Western scientists on Chernobyl. Um, and of course I had, but I also thought that that um, work had had a lot of exposure to the, to the public. And what I was trying to do with this project was to work as a historian, to look at um, the record um, and, what happened immediately after the accident. And, and what the Soviets did really well is they just went out and they took measurements of everything. They measured food, they measured soils, they measured water. They had just an army 
of radiation monitors. Um, they measured, um, you know, human thyroids, um, uh, you know, the bodies of people. They looked at, they did cytogenic analysis of uh, chromosome mutations, and they recorded all of this. And it's all sitting there in the archive. And we really don't have records like that for other nuclear emergencies. If they occurred in military sites, um, the US military, for instance, wasn't terribly curious about what was happening around its production facilities because um, that would you know, generate more problems. The Soviets um, have a lot of that stuff that at their military sites that's still classified. So this, um, the, the Hiroshima studies only began in 1950, five years after the bombing. So we really don't have real time recordings of what happens to environments and populations as they're being exposed to contaminants. And, and so that's why I think these studies, especially the Belarusian Academy of Sciences just went off on their own and, and set up case control studies. They're sitting there in the Academy of Science archives. Um, what I'm basically saying is I would I'd love to see finally a study of the long-term consequences of the Chernobyl exposure done in a longitudinal study with large numbers of people. Taking those 200,000 people uh, in the Mogila province would be a great place to start. And, um, and, and, and finally ask some open-ended questions about Chernobyl health effects. Great. There's lots of questions in the chat. I can keep on asking questions, but I will now turn to them. But I first would like to invite uh, Jessica to step in. I know she had a question she was dying to ask. Uh, Kate Brown, thank you so much for what a wonderful presentation. Very informative as well. I think you go in depth on a wide array of topics related to, to the accident. I am particularly fascinated with your ecosystem approach to kind of um, overcoming some of the barriers and obstacles related to the Cold War and the suspicion and misinformation. So um, related question uh, to this ecosystem services that are provided by nature and trees. We're also observing that right with carbon sequestration and mitigation of climate change and people are increasingly interested in the use of nature as a solution. And so I'm really curious as to, you know, because of your findings and this particular use of nature to, you know, reduce or uptake some of the, radi some of the radiation, have we observed any more systematic approaches to the using of, you know, nature and trees more specifically to um, mitigate nuclear and radiation accidents? Is there anything that's been established since or any specific species? In, uh, no, not really on a, on a large scale. You know, there are, there are studies done, you know, if you, um, I mean, uh, you know, there's the, the effort to plant like rapeseed, um, which is another uh, plant um, that, that takes up a lot of radioactivity. And what they're doing, they have, you know, whole fields of rapeseed. They're doing this in, around Japan too, um, around the Fukushima site. Uh, the the rapeseed is a, um, uh, enables you to take the radioactivity up in the plant body, but they are harvesting the oil. Um, and then the oil is, is free of radiation and then that goes into markets. And, and that's a great use of plants as allies. Um, in other ways, um, I don't see a, a, a really sort of robust and practical um, use of, um, of sort of nature. Um, the, the real emphasis in the Chernobyl contaminated areas is to get farmers back to work, farmers back to farming. And unfortunately, most of the farming there uh, is dairy farming. And as we know, um, you know, cows are really terrific at uh, picking up radioactivity in the environment and injecting it into their milk. Um, so then the farmers have to buy these ex expensive uh, filters and these expensive feeds that help to strain out radioactivity from milk. But you always see these stories, oh, oh, somebody tested the Belarusian milk and there's a lot of radioactive cesium and strontium in it. Um, so it would be more practical to, that rather than sort of pushing against the stream is to try to go with it and think of plants and crops that people can productively um, uh, plant that you either then take and, and use it as a, as a big sponge absorbing radioactive waste and planting it and then putting it in a, in a waste depository or it's like the rapeseed that you can take part of the of the plant and dispose of it, and the other part you could harvest productively. Um, I want to turn to uh, some of the questions in the chat and start with one by Professor Alexia Block of uh, Anthropology who is a, has a methodological question. She says, could you comment on the challenges of accessing archives related to Chernobyl 
what kind of bureaucratic barriers did you face and how did these change over time? Well, I was working on this project from 2014 to 2018. Um, and uh, it, it was kind of, a, I, you know, I, what, what was really curious is that the, the, the freest access was in the former Soviet Union. So Ukraine, walk right in, I even could use the, the KGB archives. And the KGB, I found out, had a whole science and technology division, really, really interesting material there. Um, Belarus is, a, is formerly a dictatorship, but at the time um, they had a, a lot of declassified uh, um, records related to Chernobyl. Um, what I found is that not many researchers had looked at the Ministry of, of Agriculture and the Ministry of Health archives to look at the vectors of contamination and what kind of um, impact was being recorded by doctors uh, in real time. Um, and, and that's a curious fact, what, you know, why that wasn't considered an important thing to do. The Belarusian Academy of Sciences have um, you know, absolutely fantastic uh, studies that are sitting there and you know, largely untapped. Where I had trouble doing research was in, um, let me turn off my phone, was in, um, at the International Atomic Energy Archives. They had had a long sailing policy of not allowing researchers in, uh, having an embargo for 40 years on their records. Uh, and the agency was only about 50 years old. So that um, they, they decided maybe we should sync it up to um, 20 years like every other UN agency. And their, um, the archivist told a colleague of mine that they were planning to do that. They're all set, they're about to sign the form to you know, release um, the archives after 20 years. But then somebody at the meeting said, well, well, what about the Chernobyl records? That means they would have access to the Chernobyl records. So then they made it 30 years. Um, and so I had pretty limited access. I, I would say the most limited access I had to records was at the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is an agency publicly funded by all of our tax money. Um, so that's a curious fact, indeed. Mm -hmm. Is this something that's challenged the, by the Board of Governors in IA or something like that? Can you, I mean, did you try? Uh, yes, I was told that I needed to find a, um, an American UN representative to um, ask for an exception, and I couldn't find a UN representative who would, who would make that request on my behalf. Okay, uh, another question from the chat, this time by Professor Hugh Gusterson. Um, saying, has what we learned from Fukushima changed our understanding of Chernobyl? You know, Hugh, I'm, I'm not sure it has. Um, I was in Shiba in 2013, you know, after the Fukushima accident. And um, I asked some scientists there, you know, well, well, what about the Chernobyl records? Are you looking at those? Um, and they sort of said, no, um, no, that's, you know, the Soviets weren't doing any, any work that's interesting to us. Um, and, and, and I heard the statements that I've heard, uh, I'd heard so many other times, like, you know, which was like, we don't know much about human exposures to chronic low doses of radi radiation. You know, the Hiroshima studies were about one big, uh, one big x-ray, basically one big, you know, uh, gamma rays going through bodies and then leaving them. Um, but so we need to know more about chronic exposures to low doses of radioactivity that people are ingesting. Um, and so the scientists in, in Japan were saying, so, you know, please give us patience, you know, have patience, just, you know, give us 15, 20 years to study this problem, which is an amazing thing to say in 2013 after um, the nuclear legacy suite had gone before it. Um, a question from Vivian. Um, thank you for the excellent presentation. Can you expand on the discrepancies of findings by the local consultants, uh, I guess she means the local researchers, and those of the UN, much of which are swept uh, under the drug? Are there reasons for this beyond that radiation is hard to study and there was censorship? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, part of the problem was is that the, the UN consultants that came in had a body of knowledge that they considered a gold standard for um, human health and radiation. That was the, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki studies. And those studies are, um, you know, sort of like a series of charts that, that uh, describe risk probabilities. You get so many sieverts of radiation, you have so much of an increased uh, percentage of getting cancer in your lifetime. And these were really important studies for um, health physicists to determine 
how much radiation uh, nuclear power plant workers should get on the job, um, how much radiation cancer patients should get undergoing treatments or um, other patients should get from diagnostic equipment, you know, CT scans and the like. So they really lived by this, these studies as their gold standard. It was really, it, it, it meant, um, it, it determined how much they were exposing people on, on their job in, in terms of radiation medicine. So when the Soviet researchers said, you know, we found at much lower doses than, than uh, that your studies um, say that people who are ingesting radioactive isotopes uh, chronically at low doses um, seem to be much sicker um, and have a whole host of health problems that are subacute. So they're not dying, they're not falling over dying. They're not getting uh, cancers that kill them immediately, um, though there was you know, a, a certain rash of leukemias, but they're getting other problems with their digestive tract, their endocrine system, their autoimmune system, uh, cardiac system. And, um, and these problems make life miserable for the people who live there. Um, that that was that was news to the to the UN uh, community, and it was very hard news to accept. So they basically sort of took this compendium of work, and I can see it happening as I work through the Unscare archives. They get this 600 page um, about 1996, a 600 page compendium of all the work that the Soviet researchers had done, and some work by Western researchers, and they they are like, well, a lot of this stuff doesn't. Um, uh, have you know used standard uh, westernized uh, protocols, research protocols? Um, it's not peer reviewed in, in the normal way we expect in the West. And so these two different um, political science, you know, science systems don't really come together very well. And so they toss out this a good part of the Soviet work, especially the Soviet work that's done by local uh, scientists on the ground. Um, and that's a real shame. I, I, I think we should go back to those studies and take them more seriously. Another problem is, as I said, these lawsuits. So in, in 1987, a year after the accident, uh, the, the American Health Physicists Association met in Columbia, Maryland for their annual meeting. And they were addressed by a lawyer from the Department of Energy. Um, those are the nuclear um, weapons people in the United States. And um, the Department of Energy lawyer said, you know, the biggest threat to, to nuclear power is not another accident like Chernobyl or Three Mile Island. The biggest threat today our lawsuits. And so what we're going to do is you're all going to go into breakout center, uh, breakout rooms, and you're going to be trained by these Department of Justice lawyers here to become expert witnesses on behalf of the U.S. government in these lawsuits as they go forward. And so that was the big thrust of the health physicists community is to minimize this impact so that, you know, what we find is most of these health physicists are working for uh, either nuclear power plants or nuclear regulatory agencies. And so they have a vested interest in seeing that nuclear power continues. Um, we have a question uh, that touches upon something you mentioned about the earlier legacy of radiation uh, there in the region. Uh, and the question asks, are there any studies that have quantified levels of radiation exposure prior to the accident? Yeah, well, just the study I was talking about that was carried out uh, between 1961 and 1965 in the, in the Pripyat marshes. That's the only study that, um, that I know of. And it's, um, the un, it, was sense, it was a censored publication, but the uncensored report um, is found in Russian and it's called... Um, the English translation of it would be the, um, the global, um, let's see, um, uh, global fallout from um, nuclear weapons testing, global fallout of cesium-137 from nuclear weapons testing. And in the censored publication, the um, researchers, and it's, um, uh, uh, Murray is the, is the chief researcher on that, says that this uh, radioactive cesium is coming from American bombs, fallout from American bombs. But it's a pretty interesting uh, source to take a look at. Great. Um, how has uh, more recent depictions of the disaster, uh, the Chernobyl miniseries, depiction in video games, etc., changed attitudes in the West towards nuclear power broadly? Has there been a change in attitudes compared to the initial attitudes and fears in the immediate aftermath of the disaster? Well, I think, you know, I, I, what I found was interesting after that uh, HBO series came out is that there was a lot of people who are, are getting, who suddenly got nervous all over again about, about Chernobyl. And so you see these statements made by the director, Craig Mazin, saying, you know, I, I, 
I wasn't, you know, saying that nuclear power is bad. Nuclear power is good. Even um, it's just that Soviet uh, nuclear power was bad, and that, that and that was bad because of their lies, because of their silences. And and then he sort of was making an analogy to the Trump administration. Um, but I think that the HBO producers were taken by surprise at how um, people were really, um, you know, got upset all over again about the about the, that dramatization of the disaster. Okay. Um, the next question says, it is interesting to see in your pictures how widespread radiation measuring instruments are. Even Berry producers have geiger muller counters. How does people's lives, um, this constant instrumental monitoring, how does it affect their perceptions of pollution? Well, I, you know, I think, um, I had a Geiger counter with me as I traveled and, and everywhere I went, people would say, oh, can you measure over here in my courtyard? Because I think we have some high levels over here and I just want to check. Or the wool workers would say, would you measure my table? Uh, because I, I want to make sure my table is clean. Um, that uh, Geiger counters for most of the people who live in these contaminated lands is, is beyond their budget. You know, Geiger counter costs like $200. They might make $2,000 a year. Um, so there, it's not something that um, is, is surprisingly widely available, um, but people want to know um, and, and they want to know for um, very specific reasons, like the, one of the berry pickers was saying, you know, I think they're measuring my berries. They're always saying my berries are too radioactive, the buyers who come by, but I think it's because the space in front of my house where they measure them is radioactive. It's not my berries. Mm -hmm. So they want to know for like very specific reasons or they wanna know because they're concerned about their own personal health. Um, but um, it, it does, I think, make people um, more uh, aware of environmental problems writ large. So there's lots of concerns about nitrates. Um, they're aware that there are a lot of artificial fertilizers used, especially during the Soviet period, and they, they're concerned about nitrates in the water. There's concerns about pesticides. Um, environmental, but they may not be out um, protesting, but environmental awareness is quite high in those areas and quite sophisticated. You have a question from Peter Bradford, the former NRC commissioner uh, asking, were you told why the US UN delegation was unwilling to ask that you be given access to IAEA records? No, no, just, I just got a negative response. Uh -huh. um, Another question is asked, thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation. What new understandings emerged from your research that would help K through 12 history, social studies teachers teach about Chernobyl? For example, you mentioned the importance of considering transnational consequences and different conceptions of historical time. Yeah, um, those are one ways. I, I think that um, Chernobyl is a, is a, um, happens in one specific time and place, but um, it is then it's but at the same time it's very distant in t the effects are very distant in time and place and i think that that's a really um, important message for young people to take in that things we do like we consume cell phones um, with uh that are full of rare minerals that are mined in other parts of the world parts of the world we don't see but those effects of those minings that will somehow come back to our environments um, and, and so many of our consumptive practices are global. And, and so Chernobyl is a, is a way to, to think about that or radioactive contaminants in general are a way to think about that. They, you know, we, we name it out to be able to see or touch or feel radioactivity, but it's very easily detectable in environments. And, and that is how we started to understand notions of, of interlinked ecologies in the 1950s and 60s is by using radioactive tracers, first from global fallout, and then from scientists going in and, and irradiating the environment specifically in order to watch um, what would happen next and where it went. Um, so I think that's one of the more important messages from Chernobyl. Great. Um, a question from Professor Lisa Sandstrom. Um, I was fascinated by your brief remark about women in the area being described as hysterical and not taken seriously in their reports of what they were experiencing and observing. Could you say more about the gendered aspects of how, how knowledge was considered in the Chernobyl context? 
Well, I think, you know, what happened is that um, it was women sitting with their kids who were sick in clinics and wait long interminable waits in crowded uh, waiting rooms and, and Soviet clinics throughout the contaminated areas. And as they sit there, they start to talk. And as they start to talk, they, they realize that their situation is not unique, that there are other mothers with kids who also have, um, whose kids pass out inexplicably, who have these sort of problems with perpetual nosebleeds, who have um, chronic uh, and continuing pneumonia and anemia and all these other symptoms. And they, they start to see patterns. Um, once they do that, they, um, they begin to mobilize. And so, um, you know, a lot of these, you know, the, the sort of the films and, and the images um, that come out uh, show these sort of village women, you know, with the, with the head scarves on. And, and they're like sort of like the least reliable narrators. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, as their letters show, they're, they're quite apt and, and they're, they're very well informed. And they're the ones who really start to mobilize. Um, I think because they're the ones who are in charge of their families and their community's health. And so they take that responsibility on themselves and they, and they start to go. Okay, I think we'll, one last question. Um, this is from Professor Alexei Koyevnikov in history asking, um, recent fires in the zone could have released much additional radiation into the air and the zone and its structures are decaying. Any reports on the effort to conserve? No, and um, I'm concerned about those fires. Uh, you know, the, there was you know, historically large fires in, in, the, in, in the area in the summer of 2020. And, um, but the reports in Kiev were saying, you know, there, that the fallout was not radioactive. Um, and th th I hope that's right, and I hope that's true. But what my concern is, is that there should be no fires in, in the Chernobyl zone, especially in the Red Forest area. And, um, and, and that's part of the problem of the nature is thriving in the Chernobyl zone narrative. Um, these contaminated areas require not humans walking away and letting nature restore itself, but humans heavily curating these areas so that the contamination doesn't spread more widely, so that the problem doesn't get worse. Um, so what should be in, in the, around the Red Forest, especially as a, as a massive sprinkler system so that fires don't occur there. Because um, once they do, they, they, you know, the winds go up, they tend to go to the Northwest or Northeast and downwind communities get contaminated in new nuclear excursions. Um, it's great that that radioactivity is decaying in the leaf litter and in the, uh, in the decaying logs. Uh, it'll take a long time, mm -hmm. but we should show some patience um, and let, and, and in that way, let nature do its thing or let radioactivity do its thing. But that, as I say, that needs uh, um, to be curated. Okay. okay, on that note, I think I'd like to thank you for this wonderful talk and more importantly for writing this great book and doing all this wonderful work. Um, and uh, thank you for sharing all that with us. Thank, thank you very you. much for having me. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody for joining and um, see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.